an original MCM production. Okay, now, Jamie Reeve, Vice President of Wealth Strategies and a Lawrence University graduate, uh, will introduce our program. Jamie? Good afternoon. Quick show of hands. Do we have any stockholders in the room? <laughs> now, Mark pledges to introduce himself to each of you afterward and ask your opinions on everything. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. My fellow Lawrence alumni and Rotarians, it's great to be here and included among them some of our guests, so thank you. Um, all right, so many of us follow the Packers on the field and many, like myself, are keenly interested to see how Ted Thompson and team do later this week with the annual restocking of the shelves. We've got the draft starting Thursday night. I understand Will's place north in Chicago is where they're having the party down there. So, off the field, everything Packers related is Mark's responsibility, and he's going to talk about some of that today. I've come to learn Mark has quite an extensive and impressive background that leads him perfectly to be the Packers president and CEO. He was an eight-year NFL player. He played safety uh, for the Redskins, earned a Super Bowl ring. I do note you were a safety, 6'4", 210. I played defensive end, 6'4", 210, Division One, Division Three. <laughs> Though I think both of us were drafted in the same round. Okay. He's a graduate of Colgate, and he then went on to get further degrees at American University, and then a law degree from Georgetown, correct? He serves on four prestigious committees. Uh, Commissioner Roger Goodell recognizes the legal background, the player positions that he's had, and so he currently serves on the NFL Management Committee, Executive Committee, the Committee the Competition Committee, the College Relations Committee, and the Health and Safety Committee. Among many of the important initiatives at the club level, he's working on building out the Titletown District to the west. And I'll note, I've lost three tailgate spots in your repurchasing uh, on Blue Ridge, so keep it coming. Uh, Mark and his wife, Lori, are proud parents of four children, ages 25 to 33, Rotarians, Laurentians and guests, please join me in welcoming to the stage, Mark Murphy. Thank you, Jamie. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, all for coming out. Uh, this uh, Milwaukee, I, I tell you, I've really, uh, in my, it's hard to believe I've been uh, in my position now uh, going on my, I'm in my ninth year, about eight and a half years, and I've really come to appreciate Milwaukee. In fact, I'm trying to get my kids to move here. You know, they're all on the East Coast. So uh, actually, my uh, daughter and her husband are going to spend the night in Milwaukee uh, on Thursday, so tell them how great it is. But it's uh, an important, obviously very important market for uh, the Packers. Uh, we just uh, we just opened about two years ago. We opened an office uh, in Milwaukee that's doing very well, and uh, just the, the history here. I think one of the real unique things uh, about the Packers is that we have the two ticket packages, the, the Milwaukee and the Green Bay packages. I'm pleased to say that for the Milwaukee package, the price actually went down this year. That doesn't happen a lot, so we're uh, excited about that. But a lot going on uh, with the Packers. Uh, obviously, this is a big week uh, for the organization with the draft coming up on Thursday. So I thought what I'd do is I'll have a, have a presentation here. I'll go through it fairly quickly and want to leave plenty of time for any questions that you may have. So I think I got it. Uh, Lambeau Field, uh, one, uh, you know, as I look at the organization, we have many assets, but uh, Lambeau Field really, to me, is you know, probably one of the most important assets that we have as an organization. And uh, it's, you know, I've seen it even in, uh, I have to give Bob, Bob Harlan and uh, the administration credit, 
the major renovation in 2003 where they uh, really updated it, added the, uh, added the atrium, really transformed Lambeau Field to where initially it was just used uh, 10 times a year just around game days that it's now, now used year round, uh, 700 events a year and uh, we see people coming from all over the world literally to, you know, I left this morning there was, there were tours getting ready to take a, a tour of Lambeau Field. So, uh, it's it's really an iconic stadium, and you'll see the challenge uh, that we've kind of faced is we we want to make the improvements and add the modern amenities that fans expect, but we don't want to take away what makes Lambeau Field special. And so, really, the especially the bowl, the inner bowl. What I tell people, it really it's it's pretty similar to when fans were watching Lombardi coach uh, in the 60s. But uh, really proud of the fact that uh, five years in a row now it's been voted the number one fan experience. And one of the things that, that I'm proud of uh, internally is that even though we pr have provided what the people think is a very good experience, we've continued to try to improve it. So the sound system, we put in a new sound system. Uh, four years ago, uh, 2012, uh, brand new video boards. The old ones were uh, not quite up to standard. Uh, the, the, the new ones are about uh, two times, twice the size of the old ones. We added the south end zone in 2013. We added about uh, almost 8,000 in seating capacity. We are now the second largest stadium uh, in the NFL, which uh, I think it's a source of pride for our shareholders, our owners, uh, that you know, here we are the, by far the smallest market in the NFL, but uh, have the second largest stadium. And it kind of goes, it's going against the grain. Most NFL stadiums are downsizing, pulling out club seats, uh, pulling out seats, uh, but we're fortunate enough, knock on wood, with the kind of fans that we have that uh, we've been able to, to increase in size. One of the things we've done, we've added three new gates. Uh, you know, the, the issue there is really getting complaints from fans. It's hard to get in and out, so with uh, additional gates, uh, makes it easier to get uh, in and out of the stadium. Uh, also, there's a revenue uh, piece of that. We will, at least while I'm uh, in my position, we will never sell the naming rights to Lambeau Field. You know, Lambeau Field is special, and so we're not, uh, it'll be, thank you. But we will sell the naming rights for gates. So, <laughs> so we, have, we have gates all over there. We've added gates. But no, that's, that's been real positive. We've had you know, some of the ones we've added, uh, the Bell and Health Gate, uh, you know, the Shopco Gate, obviously, with the South End Zone. And then the American Family Insurance Gate has been a great addition, kind of, kind of opened up uh, our whole area. Last year, we made a big investment in Wi-Fi. Uh, I guess I'm a little old school. I think when you go to a football game, you should be actually watching the game rather than your cell phone. But <laughs> millennials feel differently. They have two or three cell phones at a time. They're watching the game. But seriously, uh, if you didn't see a big improvement uh, in your uh, connectivity, there, there's a problem. So, but that, that, that was a complaint. And it's hard when you've got 80,000 people all wanting to get on their cell phones at once. Uh, but that, that was an improvement that we made that's been well received. And then we're just in the process now of moving forward with a, a major uh, suite renovations. Our, reno our suites have not been renovated since 2003. Uh, it'll be done over a two-year period. And I'll show you some pictures coming up. But the biggest change is all of the suites now will have windows that open up. And you may be thinking, is that something that I want in January? <laughs> but this is what our fans said. So it really, uh, you've, you feel like you're a part of the game uh, when, you, when, the, when you can open the windows up. Just some of the, to, to highlight some of the renovations, the more recent renovations to, to the atrium. If you haven't seen, we have a brand, brand new restaurant we opened up last year. Uh, Curly's, the restaurant we had before, was, was fine but it was kind of hidden. It was on the second floor. It was difficult to get to. The new restaurant, 1919, uh, is located on the atrium floor. The other thing we did, we have a new Hall of Fame. We were actually shut our hall. We were without a Hall of Fame uh, for about a year. Opened that up in August. And uh, if you haven't been there, it's, uh, it's, it's a must see. I'm a little biased, uh, I admit. But uh, so those are both on the atrium floor. And it makes it, uh, the atrium's much more much more active in the Hall of Fame. It's actually slightly old Hall of Fame was kind of down, hidden in the basement. It's a little better location. It's actually smaller in size, but it's more interactive. And uh, 
uh, just a lot of uh, a lot of really uh, unique exhibits. And uh, the highlight still is uh, the recreation of Vince Lombardi's uh, office, which, if when you're in Vince Lombardi's office, ironically, you have you overlook the 55-foot replica of the Lombardi Trophy. So. Where else can you have that? Uh, not a real sexy project, but if you've been to Lambeau Field recently, uh, you've noticed a lot of construction in the parking lot. That is a, a storm water retention tank that we're putting in. And uh, when you come up in the fall, you won't even know that it took place. But uh, with a lot of the buildings that we add, we've added and with uh, Titletown coming up to the west, uh, we really needed to improve uh, the stormwater retention. Uh, so uh, uh, we're able to put that in the parking lot. And then you can see a sketch there. We're working on plans for a promenade. Uh, if you've been to Lambeau Field in rec recent years, you've noticed there's a, a, a tent that we have up outside the uh, Oneida Nation gate. Uh, that's been really popular. We have the Tundra tailgate zone in there. And what this will do is it'll become more of a permanent structure. So I think it'll look fit, fit in and look better. Uh, than, uh, than the temporary tent. Titletown District, uh, something that we've been working on really for uh, almost seven years, working with local politicians, uh, particularly uh, the president of uh, the village of Ashwaubenon, Mike Obinger, has been great to work with. And uh, it's going to be about 34 acres. I'll show you a, a video in a second. But we just, uh, just had the first groundbreaking. Uh, Lodge Kohler will be a spectacular uh, hotel. We've partnered with, uh, with Kohler on that. It'll be the first four-star uh, hotel in the Green Bay area. Uh, something that uh, a lot of people uh, that we've heard from have said, geez, it'd be really nice. I'd like to have a meeting at Lambeau Field. Is there a nice hotel uh, in the area? And we said, well, what do you mean by nice? So <laughs> now, <laughs> now we can say <laughs> the Lodge Kohler. So that, and it's going to have uh, a spectacular spa. And I think it'll really will become a destination. Uh, also, the Hinterland Restaurant and Brewery. Uh, Hinterland actually has a restaurant here in Milwaukee, I believe, in the Third Ward. Uh, they've done very well in Green Bay and kind of outgrow, outgrew their, their location. So we're excited to have them as an anchor, as well as uh, the Bell and Health Sports Medicine Clinic. And uh, so everything's on schedule. We've uh, broken ground uh, to be ready by training camp of next summer. Uh, one thing, it's not really technically a part of uh, Titletown, although it's kind of right on the edge of it. Uh, we have partnered uh, a number of years ago with the Cabela's, the hunting and fishing uh, store. They've been really successful in Green Bay. Uh, last year, they had 2.8 million visitors uh, that come. So they, I think they did their homework when they uh, came to Wisconsin that they know we love, our, our, we love hunting and fishing. So that's been a really good, uh, good connection. You know, to put that in perspective, Cabela's has roughly 50 stores uh, across the, the country, and Green Bay is by far the smallest market they're in, but uh, the business in terms of uh, the number of uh, visitors is number four uh, in the country, so it's, it's performing uh, very well. Titletown District, just a, a couple sketches there to give you an idea of, uh, you know, there you can see a winter scene. Uh, we, the public plaza is going to be right in the middle. Public Plaza will be uh, roughly a third of the, the total space. Uh, all kinds of activities uh, planned there. You can see there'll be a, uh, a skating, uh, it'll actually be a skating trail, uh, a full football field in the middle. Uh, we're working with a group out of uh, New York City called the Biederman, uh, Biederman Group that uh, has done a number of different uh, parks in, in cities. The one that was most of most interest to us uh, was in downtown Buffalo uh, which is a similar city to, to Green Bay. Uh, Canal Side Park there has really uh, completely rejuvenated downtown Buffalo. So we're really excited about the impact uh, that this uh, uh, title town and particularly the public plaza can have. You can see uh, one of the signature items uh, in the lower right portion of the sketch would be a replica, I think about a 15-foot replica of Bart Starr's Super Bowl I trophy. So... I think if I push again, all right, here's the video.
Title Town is in the shape of the Lombardi Trophy. <laughs> All right, well, that gives you a little idea of uh, uh, what Title Town will look like. So it's very exciting. I uh, think it'll have a, a big impact on uh, Green Bay and the community, and uh, really, uh, really excited about it. I mentioned the suite renovation. This gives you an idea of uh, kind of the change. You can see to the left there. The windows will go up. Uh, well, it's kind of hard to describe, but they'll go up, but then there'll be, you can see through, uh, you'll be able, there'll be no, no windows down on the bottom, and you'll be able to see the whole field, so uh, a nice, a nice change there. You know, from a football standpoint, I just wanted to talk briefly, um, you know, we're very, uh, very proud of uh, the consistent success we've had. Yes, we're disappointed that we've only won one Super Bowl, uh, but... Uh, if you don't get in the playoffs, you can't win a Super Bowl, and uh, only two teams in the NFL have been in the playoffs seven straight years. And there's a joke there, uh, and I'm not going to dump on the Patriots, but I would just say that we have used fully inflated footballs uh, in all of our games. <laughs> and last year, uh, playoffs, uh, very disappointed we didn't win the division. It's really kind of strange the way it worked out. Uh, we ended up uh, with a matchup that we really felt good about, uh, playing the Redskins in the first round. Uh, kind of a, it was a very strange feeling for me having, uh, having played for the Redskins, but uh, I did not have mixed emotions at all. I was very pleased that we beat the Redskins. You can see uh, our game against the Cardinals, a uh, very difficult loss. You know, two years in a row now, we've, I guess losses in the playoffs are always difficult, but uh, the Seattle one was, was really tough. And this one was, was uh, difficult, um, although I was very proud of the way we play. I thought we fought hard. And uh, I told uh, Michael Bidwell, the uh, president and the owner of the, of the Cardinals, I said, you know, this would have been a great game to watch if I didn't have a vested interest in it. It was, just, it was, it was actually voted the, the best, uh, best game of last, uh, last season. I think the Cardinal fans enjoy it more than ours, though. Uh, I talked to a couple fans about this. One of the things we're really excited about is uh, we will be hosting a college football game. Uh, Badgers are going to be uh, coming up to uh, Lambeau Field on September 3rd. It's the first college football game that we've hosted uh, since 1983. Uh, I do not think you will probably, if I ask you to guess, you will not remember. Uh, we hosted, in 1983, Fordham and St. Norbert College. And <laughs> So the, I think we'll have a better crowd this game. So the, the thought process was uh, Vince Lombardi went to Fordham. People would want to go watch his alma mater play. Uh, so, but it's, we're excited. Carmex, uh, obviously here in the Milwaukee area, great, great company. They'll be a presenting sponsor. And uh, the University of Wisconsin Athletic Department uh, has been great to work with. Barry Alvarez and uh, Paul Christ have just been great. We had a, they had a practice in the Don Hudson Center, uh, so I had a chance to, to talk to the players, and uh, they're very excited about it. Actually, a, a group from LSU uh, was up, and they're very excited about it. Uh, LSU fans are known for traveling, so they have 20,000 seats, tickets, and they want more. So I think the Kohl, all the Kohler golf courses are already sold out for that week. Uh, one of the things we're proud of, Obviously, we're a community-owned team, and so for us, giving back to the community is, is a, a very big, uh, big priority. Uh, we have a foundation that uh, has really grown. Our corpus is now over 20 million, and one of the things we started about three or four years ago was what we call impact grants. So we give out, I think, uh, you know, one and a half, uh, about a million and a half dollars a year, uh, but what we've started doing now is giving $250,000 grants to really make an impact in the community. And you can see the, the two impact grants that we gave this past year. One of the things that we're uh, really uh, excited about within, uh, within the organization is our digital presence, both uh, on our website, uh, but also uh, we work very closely with our partner, Time Warner Cable and uh, look to be uh, doing more programming for them in uh, something that uh, I think will be both good for them and the, and the Packers. Uh, I mentioned before uh, we were the uh, game of the year. Uh, the play of the year, though, was our Hail Mary from uh, Detroit. But I think, can the receivers get far enough down the field? Rodgers. 
in trouble. It's going to get there. He turned 32 yesterday. Does he have a vintage moment in him? In the end zone, it is caught for the win. Richard Rodgers with a walk-off touchdown. A game ender for the Packers. <laughs> that was, uh, I've, been, I've been around football a long time. I, that was one of the most amazing plays I've ever seen. I've got, uh, there's a shot of the sideline, so you can see Richard going up to, to catch the ball. And it's the way they caught it, in, and in, in the stands, there's a fan with a Packers jersey on and a cheese head with his hands going like this. And then there's a Lions fan with his hand on his head. <laughs> so Brett Favre, a uh, lot going on uh, with Brett, really exciting. I think. I think most of you know, uh, obviously, Brett had a tremendous career with the Packers, uh, ended his career uh, with the Packers and, and moved on to the Jets and then the Vikings. Uh, so, but it, and it was a difficult time, I think, for the organization. Uh, happened to be very early in my tenure, so uh, welcome to my new position. But uh, really pleased that we're able to, to mend fences and bring Brett uh, back into the, to the fold. Uh, last year, we retired his number. I tell you that, you know, talking to friends of mine around the NFL, they, they just, they were amazed that, so we ended up selling out our stadium. Now, I char, you know, this was an executive decision I made. Uh, I decided when we, we opened it up, we were, because we, we were going to retire his number, we always have a Hall of Fame, uh, our Hall of Fame banquet uh, in, we normally hold it in the atrium. And, the demand and a lot of people wanted to come to be able to see it and uh, so we kind of went back and forth what can we do so we decided well listen we'll open it up open the stadium up and they can watch people can watch it on the video boards and we didn't really and it was so it was on local it was on TV as well so we didn't really know how many people would come and so we decided well let's open it up and uh, wanted to know well what should we charge people and so I came up with four because of Brett Favre's number four, I thought it was appropriate. Uh, we sold out in less than two hours. So <laughs> that, but it just, I mean, no other franchise in the NFL could have done that, to, to watch a ceremony on the video boards. But uh, when Brett walked out into the stadium, and to see the, the reaction that, uh, of the fans and the, the ovation and the, react, and the reception that he received was, was really very moving. And then, of course, we unveiled his number uh, at halftime of uh, the Bears game on Thanksgiving, uh, which was, uh, again, a great event, although it was about 30 degrees and raining. <laughs> somebody, uh, somebody said, Mark, you seem kind of cold up there. I said, well, I was. <laughs> but uh, to me, the highlight of that was uh, that uh, Bart Starr, uh, was able to make it back, and so he was uh, there to congratulate and uh, to share uh, share that moment with uh, Brett. And of course, now uh, Brett's been inducted, uh, first ballot uh, inductee into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and uh, so we'll be out in Canton for that, and uh, and then actually we'll play in the Hall of Fame game uh, on Sunday, August seventh. Just quickly, in terms of NFL issues. Uh, it's hard to believe, but uh, the NFL went uh, over 20 years without having a team in L.A. Uh, and uh, really excited about uh, the move of the Rams uh, to L.A. It was a little, it was a difficult process. There were really, it was kind of the race to L.A. There were uh, two competing stadium projects, uh, the, the Rams project, and then one shared um, by the Raiders and the, uh, the Chargers. That would have been in Carson. At the end of the day, I think uh, the Rams' vision and uh, their plans for the stadium uh, really were very impressive. Uh, if you see the stadium there, uh, the stadium alone uh, will be $2.8 billion. Now, that's a billion more than any other stadium has ever cost. So to give you, an, uh, put in a little perspective, but uh, the whole, their plans for that whole area are really very impressive. Uh, and it's, it'll take a th it's going to take three years for the stadium to be built. Uh, they'll play in the LA, LA Coliseum for, for the next three years. Now, meanwhile, you've got situations, both the, the Chargers and the Raiders are in old uh, stadiums built for baseball. And so they're looking at, uh, they're, they've got a year now to try to 
uh, try to work out uh, leases uh, in, in their respective cities. If they are not able to do that, they, uh, they can join in with the, uh, with the, with the, the Rams to be uh, tenants or partners in, in the stadium. The Raiders are also looking at uh, the possibility of maybe moving uh, out of the, the Bay Area to either Las Vegas or San Antonio. Thursday night football, uh, I don't know if you like it or not, but it, it's here to stay. Uh, one of the things we're worried about in the NFL is we want to make sure we don't uh, overexpose and have too many games on, but you know the, the ratings continue to be very strong. Reality is, uh, and it's all sports, uh, very few people watch TV live anymore. And so uh, for NFL games, NBA, other sports, uh, it's one of the few things that people watch live. And so the ratings have stayed real strong for the NFL, and advertisers uh, and networks are willing to pay a premium because they know that people are watching it. And so the Thursday night package, uh, it's going to be an 18-game package now. Uh, and one of the things the league has done, they've experimented with it, is in addition to broadcast, uh, also uh, having what they call over the top, which I did not know what it is, but that's streaming live on the Internet. We did an experiment with that for one of our London games, uh, one of our London games, an NFL London game, and uh, very well received. Had, it really opens up uh, a global audience, and we had uh, over 17 million people uh, internationally that watched, uh, watched that uh, London game. And the most exciting thing this year, everybody that plays on Thursday night will be play, wearing the Color Rush uniforms. Uh, so we will be playing... We play the Bears on uh, Thursday night, and uh, we will be wearing a very unique uniform, let me just say that, <laughs> which will be announced uh, soon. Traditionalists will not like the look of this uniform. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Breaking news here. In fact, I see, yeah, the, I got the, the gavel here. Uh, a lot of news uh, in the NFL. Uh, just, just yesterday, uh, got uh, some, uh, got a very positive, from the league's perspective, a very uh, positive ruling from uh, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. They re he reinstated Tom Brady's four-game suspension. And, um, you know, I, it, the, the whole deflategate, it's been about a year and a half now. Obviously, uh, negative publicity for the league, it continues on. But uh, I, I think it was very positive for the league from the perspective of it really um, – it, it reinforced the commissioner's authority under the collective bargaining agreement. So what happened is, you know, you, you have a process you go through, and then there's a grievance procedure. And uh, courts typically are very reluctant to get involved into uh, collectively bargained grievance procedures. I think the feeling is, you know, the parties know best their industry. If they negotiate it, uh, that should be good enough. So. The standard for a court to get involved in overturning uh, uh, an arbitrator's decision is really very high, that you know, there was really an unfair process. And so the, the, the district court there felt that there was an unfair process. The Court of Appeals, though, looked at it and said the parties negotiated this, and uh, they, they, so they overturned uh, the decision and reinstated the, the suspension. So we'll see. Now they, they can either ask for a, a hearing of the, the entire panel of judges or appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, concussion settlement, very positive news there. The concussion, and I'll talk a little bit in a second about uh, the concussion issue regarding the NFL. There's no question. Uh, it's the biggest issue facing uh, not just the NFL, but facing football. Uh, concerns about the safety of the game, particularly as it relates to concussions. And so we, we had a class action lawsuit filed by uh, former players, and we were able to settle that, um, a minimum of $765 million. Uh, so it's very substantial settlement. But um, the good thing about it is you're, you're able to get money to players that, uh, that need it. And so that's it's very positive, and, and we can't start paying out until, uh, until uh, the appeals are, are all exhausted. And then just also kind of re related to Deflategate, uh, there was a good arbitrator's decision or a positive arbitrator's decision recently on uh, the commissioner's authority. This kind of related to the, the Adrian Peterson case and some of the others where 
the commissioner put players on the commissioner's exempt list, uh, and they were being paid while, uh, but they couldn't play. They were being paid while they were on the exempt list. The union challenged it, and uh, the arbitrator ruled for the league. You know, I think the whole issue of personal conduct and uh, disciplinary procedures is something that um, will probably end up being negotiated with the Players Association. We're halfway through our 10-year collective bargaining agreement, and I know that that's a big issue for the players. They want to have a, a more neutral uh, arbitration procedure. So that's something I think will, uh, will eventually be resolved in collective bargaining. I mentioned before uh, concussions uh, this past year. For two or three years in a row, our concussions had gone down. So it was a little alarming this year when concussions in the regular season, regular season games, uh, jumped up by 58%. And so we studied it. Uh, and uh, I think it's, you know, sometimes you just have more injuries. That's uh, it's kind of uh, the luck of the draw. So I think that was part of it. But I think also what's happened is we've got a lot more people looking at. Uh, we've got uh, certified trainers. We've got uh, neurologists in the stadium, up in the press box, looking down, trying to identify players that might have been con concussed. So from, 19, from 2014 to 2015, uh, twice as many uh, players uh, were uh, pulled, up, pulled, up, pulled aside for screening. So that, that uh, led to the increase. Then I think also there's been a real change in culture. Uh, quite honestly, I think a lot of our players are, uh, rightly so, worried about uh, the impact and the long-term uh, effect that concussions might have on them, and so they're more willing to self-report, uh, and not always, uh, maybe during the game, but sometimes the day after, and uh, also teammates and coaches are now more willing to pull aside a player and say, hey, something's wrong, we, you need to get checked out. So, um, you know, again, though, it's, it's something we're trying to do everything we can to reduce the number of concussions. You can see uh, a number of different rules that we uh, instituted this year with a safety focus. Over the last five years, there have been 40 rules uh, that have been instituted that have a safety impact. Or, uh, so it's really uh, it's something we're looking at as well as uh, college football. Uh, ticketing, I mentioned before that uh, the gold package uh, tickets, uh, the price went down. This is something that we've studied. A uh, number of leagues, a number of uh, teams uh, have moved to it. But uh, the thing that really uh, allowed us to move forward, at first the league said you had to have three tiers. So preseason and then two within the regular season. And uh, for us, it was really hard with the green and the gold ticket packages to come up with a fair system. And, uh, but then the league relented a little bit and said, you know, you can just have two tiers, preseason and regular season. So with that, we reduced this year, we reduced the price of the preseason. Uh, so overall, you're paying the same amount, but you're paying a little more for the regular season and less for the preseason games. I think the preseason games are now $45, you know, rather than an average of, of like 90. And some people say, well, what, what's the difference? What difference does it make? The advantage is it's easier to sell your tickets, uh, your pre tickets to the preseason game when the face value is, uh, is, is that, that much less. Uh, a huge issue for the league, uh, uh, a tremendous, a big initiative is uh, playing game, trying to play more games internationally. Uh, and this is something that I always get asked. We would love to play a game in London, uh, but we're not willing to give up a home game. That means too much to, to the Green Bay community. And then the issue is that our fans travel so well uh, that teams that are host would be hosting us for – our away games uh, are reluctant to give up a Packer home game, a Packer game, because we travel so well. Um, Shad Khan, who's the owner of Jacksonville, uh, I've gotten to know fairly well, so I called him up and said, Shad, you know, we'd love to play, because uh, we're playing in Jacksonville this year, and I said, you know, we'd love to play you in London. And he said, all right, there's no way in hell I'm going to give up your game. You know, all your Packer, all your cheeseheads, are, we're gonna, we'll sell more, set, more seats for that game. So. It's, it's a challenge, but hopefully uh, at some point we'll be able to, to play a game internationally. Also, there will be a regular season uh, game this year in Mexico City, uh, the Raiders and the Texans, and then uh, a regular season game in 2018 in China. So it's, this is a, a, an initiative that, as you look at it, 
really, uh, you know, when you compare the NFL to NBA or Major League Baseball, we're really way behind in terms of uh, international support of the game, uh, knowledge of our game. So uh, it's an area where I think there's uh, really room for, uh, for growth. So with that, I, uh, I know you got a lot of you get back to work, but I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that uh, any of you have about uh, the Packers or who we might draft. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, it is true, and this was done um, probably a couple months ago. Uh, you can take you can. I mean, I, you, you, the teams do that. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, some, you, I mean, it, it it helps them a little bit. What they did was, and I don't know the exact specifics, but basically, they they changed uh, his compensation from salary to signing bonus. I think he got like a thirty million dollar signing bonus. And his salary went from roughly 19 million to 1 million. So, um, and by missing four games, you'll miss, uh, you know, his uh, reduction, his salary would re be reduced by a quarter. Uh, so it's, he'll, he'll lose 250,000 rather than <laughs> quite a bit less. So you can draw, you can draw whatever assumption you want from that. Yeah. It's kind of similar. I, well, is there media here? I, I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> the, uh, one of the things that the uh, Court of Appeals found very interesting was that uh, right before Tom Brady was called in to uh, meet with the NFL, he destroyed his cell phone. But he said he destroys his cell phone on a regular basis. We all do, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> but he, that, that was the only cell phone he destroyed. He didn't destroy the other ones. The other thing that's kind of interesting, uh, one of the assistant equipment managers uh, who allegedly uh, worked with Tom to deflate the balls, his nickname was the deflator. <laughs> and and uh, the argument was that, well, his nickname was a deflator because he was trying to lose weight. So... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mark, uh, last week we had a speaker here about. Yeah, you know that's a great, uh, great question, and and you know obviously it's uh, uh, it's it's an issue for the NFL, but it's really an issue I think for all contact sports, uh, and you know the NFL has gotten all the publicity on it, but you know we're to be honest, it's very frustrating. You know uh, I'm fortunate enough I sit on competition committee and. Uh, this year, we watched, uh, there were 182 concussions that were suffered during the regular season. We watched a videotape of every single concussion. Now, some, you know, like particularly linemen, you, you can't really identify exactly when it was. But the frustrating thing about it was there was no, there didn't seem to be a consistent theme. It was a lot by their own teammates. Um, but, you know, the one thing, uh, the most dangerous play in the league by far is the kickoff. And so the change that we made in moving the touchback should uh, reduce the number of kickoffs, kickoff returns. Um, and particularly concussion, the concussion rate is very high on the kickoffs. But you know, you're right, I mean, it's part of what makes the NFL so exciting is that it's fast and it's physical. Um, the, the kickoff return is one of the most exciting plays in the NFL. Um, but when you watch the plays, you know, you, you know that uh, it's, it's a dangerous play. I don't think we'll, you know, we may get to the point where we have, have, don't have kickoff returns. We just give the ball, but, you know, then you're giving up the onside kick and, uh, you know, it, it, it takes away from some of the excitement of the game. You know, to your question, you know, the game, the game you, watch, you watch, when you watch film clips of Dick Buckus and Ray Nitschke playing and the way they hit people, uh, and even, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, players, you know, using their helmet as a weapon, uh, I, we've, we, we've really changed the game. It's different now. It's more wide open. Uh, it's still fast and it's physical, but I, I think what we have done, I think we changed the culture a little bit. Uh, we had really allowed the players to get to a point where it was accepted that they were, could use the helmet as a weapon. And they were going after players with their helmet. 
And uh, so that, that has been one of the real priorities is to, to get the helmet out, get the helmet out of uh, being used as a weapon. Um, and you know, actually one of the things we've actually had very serious talks about is whether it would make sense to take the face mask off or to reduce the size of the face mask. Because the way the helmet is now, it really the, the players have a sense that they can't be hurt. And you know, you watch you know, years ago players tackled with their shoulders, they wrapped up, you know, now they're leading with a head, uh, or were. Uh, so we're we've been successful, but it's it's something we just have to keep working on. And the, the difficult part with concussions and you know, talking to doctors, and uh, I'm sure it was fascinating to, to talk to them, but it's still the science, we still don't know a lot about, uh, about it. And uh, there's the old saying is, if you've seen one concussion, you've seen one concussion. Each one is different. And so there's really, really a, a difficult process. The other thing that's kind of a worry, um, I think particularly, well, certain positions line is um, not necessarily the con concussive blows, but what they call sub-concussive blows. So if you're a lineman and you hit your head repeatedly, you don't necessarily have a concussion, but the repetition of the constant pounding uh, can lead to problems down the road. So that's, you know, the, you know, the, uh, I don't know if people saw the movie Concussion, but the, the links and the connection between playing football or having concussions and CTE, you know, that's, Again, I, you know, it's, it's the biggest issue facing the league, and it's the biggest risk uh, for the league going forward. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> boy, you guys are asking me tough questions. Uh, I would just say this. Uh, I think there will come a time when we will say, gosh, I can't believe they used to have a team named the Redskins. So I... Well, yeah, you know, it's really uh, it's something that is an issue uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, it's been dis dis discussed quite a bit. Uh, and, but at this point, it's really up to the Redskins owner, Dan Snyder, and he shows no inclination to, to change. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I think there's obviously a lot of people uh, who are very much in favor of uh, changing, uh, changing the nickname. Although I think among Redskins fans, it's that's one thing. That's one area where the fans are very supportive. Uh, I think a majority are supportive of Dan Snyder just because of the history of, of the name. But you know, uh, like I said, times change, and uh, you know, it's it is offensive to uh, you know uh, uh, quite a few people. Yeah. Sure. Oh, how, how's Jordy Nelson doing? Jordy is uh, doing great. Uh, Jordy is, Jordy is just one of those special uh, people. He's just, you know, I mean, when his career's done, he'll, he's he's just he's a farm boy from Kansas and uh, very down to earth, uh, tireless worker and very smart. And uh, I just felt so bad. I mean, it was when we watched that it was in a meaningless every game every preseason game is meaningless but uh just to see him and he wasn't even touched just to see his knee uh injury the way it occurred uh was really difficult and uh but he is he's uh worked hard in his rehabilitation uh and yeah i think you know he'll he'll be 100 percent by start of training camp the our trainers and doctors are at a point now where they're having to hold him back and so we miss Jordy, obviously, on the field, uh, but he's such a leader that uh, his presence was missed in the locker room as well. I mean, he was around, but, um, you know, he's, he's just uh, such a hard worker and so intelligent, and he and Aaron have uh, such, a, such a great relationship that they're on the same page, and uh, I think we really miss that. So it's, it'll be very good to, to have him back. Yeah, we're getting a Pro Bowl receiver back. You know, that's can't can't complain about that. Now, the the issue is, you know, he's I think he'll turn 31 this season, and you know, for receivers, uh, you know, that's when receivers often start to to drop off. But <clears throat> I think uh, you know, Jordy has a couple things going for him. Uh, obviously, his intelligence, but also his size. So I think uh, even if he maybe loses uh, a little bit in terms of his 
speed and a route running, uh, you know, he's he'll, he'll be able to make it up in other areas. So it's very exciting to have him back. Yeah, way over there. Yeah, can I? Uh, uh, question is, what 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 are our priorities for the draft? Uh, well, I'll tell you, it's always the best player available. I mean, that's the. Uh, but now I, I think obviously you know you can look at it, and much has been made with the the media. I think uh, you know defensive and offensive line. You never have a good good line, enough good linemen. Uh, you know B.J. Raji. Uh, I think his hiatus was was a surprise. You know whether he'll be able to come back after a year. You know who knows. I you know by the way I uh, I had a very good talk with uh, B J. He's you know, just really have great respect for him. But uh, uh, the easy thing would have been you know just to take the money and uh, you know come back and play. But uh, he's a very thoughtful person, and you know he's his mother and I think his aunt were really struggling with health issues, and he wanted to be there with them, and so I give him credit for that. Um, and then I, you know, I think uh, you know uh, both inside and outside linebacker would be a, an area where we could could help ourselves. Um, and you know, tight end we signed we signed a free agent. I hope you all know, yes. Uh, but we you know uh, probably uh, could help ourselves a little bit at tight end as well. Yes, young lady there. Yeah, you know the qu questions about the uh, the draft. It's uh, it's a fascinating process. Uh, I'm not actively involved in the draft, although uh, I'll be in the we call it the draft room uh, up in Green Bay. You know, I think a lot of people think that we all go to Chicago, but really the we <laughs> the people we send to Chicago are the assistant equipment managers, kind of the the, the deflator. So they just turn in our <laughs> just turn in our uh, picks. But uh, so all the work is done uh, in uh, in Green Bay. Yeah, there's a board, and uh, the board we've got, uh, you know, you got all you got seven rounds, and then free agents, and we've got all the players up there, and we've got, you know, it's interesting, you know, you so there's 30, 32 picks in the the first round, uh, only 31 this year because New England uh, uh, forfeited their uh, first round pick. Uh, and so we got um, prob roughly 30 players that we think uh, are first round, uh, have first round talent, and then second, third, fourth. And, uh, you know, it's really fascinating. You'll see, I mean, sometimes you'll see players go off uh, in the first round that we have rated, you know, as third or fourth and vice versa. So it's, it's really, uh, you know, each team is kind of unique in terms of what, uh, how they value uh, talent. But uh, just it's a fascinating process, and you know you're not you never bat 100 percent. But uh, you know I think you know Ted I think this is 11 his 11th draft now, and you know we hit we hit on a lot more than we miss. And this year we've got two extra picks, we've got uh, compensatory picks at the end of the fourth round, and a lot of people say, well you know what what good are fourth round picks? How can they help you? Well, if you look at our starting offensive line this year, we've got four fourth-round picks and a fifth-round pick. So you can get some very good players uh, in the fourth round. And, uh, yeah, so it, uh, you, you never, especially now, and we're really glad. We're glad we're picking uh, at the end of the draft. But it's really hard to sit here now and think, you know, who's going to be available uh, when, you know, when we pick at number 27. But I think they have, a, they have an idea. And... Uh, the other thing, you know, so when we're on the clock, once you get on the clock, and in the first, first few rounds you have more time, but, uh, you know, it's, it's impressive. You can tell, you know, that this is something that Ted and his staff have been working towards the entire year. And once we're on the clock, well, first of all, you, you get a lot of calls, you know, teams willing to, wanting to possibly trade up to get your pick. And, but then also just, you know, the debating who are the players uh, that we might be interested in. And... For us, uh, a couple big issues: uh, character. You know, if and I've seen a lot. If you know, if somebody you know is you know, there've been red flags. They've been arrested. There've been other issues. Uh, we'll 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 take them off the board. And then injuries uh, are a huge issue. Uh, and you know, so uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, one of the first things we'll ask is, you know, our team physician, 
our physicians, you know, what, what's, you know, what's your take? You know, he's had an injury. Do you think he's going to be able to come back? Will he still be 100 percent? So it's a lot of different issues that, uh, that go into uh, uh, the selection. Thank you. One more question before, uh, one more question. Let's say yes, right there. Sure, question about Bart Starr. Uh, yeah, he's, I won't sugarcoat it, he's struggling. You know, he's, uh, he's had multiple uh, strokes. Uh, he's had a heart attack. Uh, I did not think there was any way that he would make it up for uh, Brett Favre's uh, retirement, or the uh, unveiling of his number. But he, um, Sherry is just, uh, his wife Sherry is just an angel. And uh, that, that was something that they had pushed towards and, and really used, used uh, to motivate Bart. And now he's, he's had experimental, I think a couple times now he's gone down to Mexico for experimental uh, stem cell treatments that have uh, been helpful. But um, you know, he's, he's uh, still not out of the woods yet. But uh, just he's such a great person, gosh. Uh, but, and he's just so beloved and you know, I know he wants to, he'll, he'll want to come up and they'll want to come up, but it's, it's getting harder and harder for him to travel. Well, listen, I know I got to turn it over. I want to thank you all for coming out. Thank you. production.